The truth is that evil is stopped in our lives when we choose to follow God. Now we have to make that choice, but that's a very interesting thing we're going to study on this program. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this program is called Bible Discovery, and we want to thank you for joining us and spending the time with us in about five minutes. We're going to study Jeremiah chapter 41. This is really something, getting into the last chapters of Jeremiah. But uh, right now, Corey is here with Ryan. Corey? I'm talking about the enemy king of the Ammonites as described in Jeremiah chapter 40. Ryan? Well, Isaiah and Jeremiah both refer to God as the Holy One of Israel. And today I want to focus on the significance of that title. Corey and Ryan are coming up in about 20 minutes time. So stay there. You'll want to be a part of that. Janice also coming up in 25 minutes. Janice? I just thought I would bring out some interesting points of Jeremiah chapter 41. Jeremiah 41, 1 through 18. Now it came to pass in the seventh month that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Elishama, of the royal family, and of the officers of the king, came with ten men to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikim, at Mizpah. And there they ate bread together in Mizpah. Then Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and the ten men who were with him, arose and struck Gedaliah, the son of Ahikim, the son of Shaphan, with the sword, and killed him, whom the king of Babylon had made governor over the land. Ishmael also struck down all the Jews who were with him, that is, with Gedaliah at Mizpah, and the Chaldeans who were found there, the men of war. And it happened on the second day after he had killed Gedaliah, when as no one yet had knew it, that certain men came from Shechem, from Shiloh, and from Samaria, eighty men with their beards shaved and their clothes torn, having cut themselves with offerings and incense in their hand to bring them to the house of the Lord. Now Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, went out from Mizpah to meet them, weeping as he went along. And it happened as he met them that he said to them, Come to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam. So it was when they came into the midst of the city that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, killed them and cast them into the midst of a pit, he and the men who were with him. But ten men who were found among them who said to Ishmael, Do not kill us, for we have treasures of wheat, barley, oil, and honey in the field. So he desisted and did not kill them among their brethren. Now the pit into which Ishmael had cast all the dead bodies of the men who he had slain because of Gedaliah was the same one Asa the king had made for fear of Baasha king of Israel. Ishmael the son of Nethaniah filled it with the slain. Then Ishmael carried away captive all the rest of the people who were in Mizpah the king's daughters, and all the people who remained in Mizpah, whom Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, had committed to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikim. And Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, carried them away captive, and departed to go over to the Ammonites. But when Johanan, the son of Kerea, and all the captains of the forces that were with him, heard of all the evil that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, had done, they took all the men, and went to fight with Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah. And they found him by the great pool that is in Gibeon. So it was, when all the people who were with Ishmael saw Johanan, the son of Kiriah, and all the captains of the forces who were with him, that they were glad. Then all the people whom Ishmael had carried away captive from Mizpah turned around and came back, and went to Johanan, the son of Kiriah. But Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, escaped from Johanan with eight men and went to the Ammonites. Then Johanan, the son of Kareah, and all the captains of the forces that were with him, took from Mizpah all the rest of the people whom he had recovered from Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, after he had murdered Gedaliah, the son of Ahikim, the mighty men of war, and the women 
and the children and the eunuchs whom he had brought back from Gibeon. And they departed and dwelt in the habitation of Kimham, which is near Bethlehem, as they went on their way to Egypt because of the Chaldeans. For they were afraid of them because Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, had murdered Gedaliah, the son of Ahikim, whom the king of Babylon had made governor in the land. Jeremiah chapter 41, verses 1 through 18. Jeremiah 41, 42, 43, and 44. That's what we read today. You know, peace is a strange and infrequent virtue in this world where sin runs deep and unchecked in the human heart. The reason we have no peace is sin, S-I-N. We often explain sin away by calling it, it's natural and emphasizing reasons for our behavior. And we get used to living in our sinful state and even under the repercussions for our actions. But the truth is we're not free in our natural state at all. Freedom comes when our hearts are no longer captured by sin, our natural state. Doing what we want when we want is not to do what we were made for. Understand that. We are meant to fulfill God's call on our lives. Now, I know that goes backwards, but it's true. A part of that call is to work with and for each other and other people, choosing not to fight against each other. In ancient Judah, the prophet Jeremiah was calling on those who were suffering because of their rebellion. God did not want them to destroy them, but he had rejected they had rejected him and fought each other until their destruction was inevitable. Now understand this, that we as people need to follow God. And when we do so, we, we realize the ultimate joy God gives us because we're made to be complete with him. That's the essence of what we talk about today. And we're going to pray. Father, I pray as we study, there is no peace from Jeremiah chapter 41. It's a long read today, but help us, Father. Help us to hear your word and help us to understand what you're saying. Because in the name of Jesus Christ, we need to hear what it means to be a Christian in this time. Be with us and help us. And we thank you, Lord. And we said together, amen and amen. Let's read the scripture. Very important. Now it came to pass in the seventh month that Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, the son of Elishama, of the royal family and the officers of the king, came with ten men to Gedaliah, the son of Achaham, and at Mizpah. And there they ate bread together at Mizpah. Then Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, and the ten men who were with him arose, and they struck Gedaliah, the son of Achaham, the son of Shaphan, with the sword, and they killed him, whom the king of Babylon had made governor over the land. Ishmael also struck down all of the Jews who were with him, that is, with Gedaliah at Mizpah, and the Chaldeans who were found there, men of war. And it happened on the second day after he had killed Gedaliah, when as yet no one knew it, that certain men came from Shechem and Shiloh and from Samaria. 80 men with their beards shaved and their clothes torn, having cut themselves with offerings and incense in their hand to bring them to the house of the Lord. Now Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, went out from Mizpah to meet them, weeping as he went along. And it happened as he met them that they said to him, come, or he said to them, come to see Gedaliah, the son of Achahim, which he killed. So it was when they came into the midst of the city that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, killed them and cast them into the midst of the pit and he and the men who were with him. But 10 men were found among them who said to Ishmael, don't kill us for we have treasures of wheat and barley and oil and honey in the field. So he desisted and did not kill them among their brethren. Now the pit into which Ishmael had cast all of the dead bodies of the men whom he had slain because of Gedaliah was the same one 
Asa, the king, had made for the fear of Basha, king of Israel. Now, Ismael, the son of Nathanael, filled, filled it with the slain. Then Ishmael carried away captives and all the rest of the people who were in Mizpah, the king's daughter and all the people who remained at Mizpah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, had committed to Gedaliah, the son of Echam. Now, as Ishmael and Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, carried them away captive and departed to go over to the Ammonites. Ishmael was a rebellious man. He was rebellious against God's punishment. Evil unleashed when, it is, when we reject the discipline of God and his Holy Spirit happens to us. Evil is released. The evil going on here is absolutely stunning. Now, let's go on because this is important. Jeremiah 41, 11 to 14. But when Jeho Jehanahan, the son of Kara, and all of the captains of the forces that were with him heard of all the evil that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, had done, they took all the men and went to fight with Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and they found him by the great pool that is in Gibeon. So it was when all the people who were with Ishmael saw Jonathan, son of Kerah, and all of the captains of the force who were with him, that they were glad. And then all the people whom Ishmael had carried away captive from Mizpah turned around and came back and went to Jonathan, the son of Kerah. Now, this is interesting. More evil is stopped when we choose to follow God's plan. In the midst of evil, we must choose to follow God's plan. Our plans are weak as individuals. God's plan is strong. Our plans are weak as individuals. In the midst of all of the evil going on in the world, in the midst of all of the crisis happening, and we see it happening in the scripture, crisis after crisis after crisis, after, and it's like one bad news after another, the people realized there's so much evil going on, we have no idea which end is up, so they go back to God. And you know what? The ones who did survived. Very interesting. Now let's go on to the next verse. This is interesting. But Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, escaped from jo Johanan uh, with eight men and went to the Amorites, or Ammonites. And then Jonathan, the son of Kerah, and all of the captains of the forces that were with him took from Mizpah, all the rest of the people whom he had recovered from Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, after he had murdered Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the mighty men of war and the women or the women and the children and the eunuchs whom he had brought back from Gibeon. And they departed and dwelt in the habitation of Chimham, which is near Bethlehem, as they went on their way to Egypt because of the Chaldeans, for they, they were afraid of them because Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, or, had murdered Gedaliah, the son of Achaim, whom the king of Babylon had made governor in the land. Which brings me to the third point. The enemy of our enemy may be the worst kind of evil. <laughs> the only way to counter evil is to pursue God and his good. Bottom line. Evil going, evil coming, this happening, that happening. In the midst of evil, which we are living now in our countries, in the midst of evil, our decision must be look beyond any governments, any political parties of this world. Look beyond that and go to God and say, Lord Jesus, I come back to you. I need, to, I, I need help. We need help. So, Father, today we pray for our nations they need to return to you. Lord, we need help. There's so much evil flying around and doing all kinds of things. We need help. We see it here. We need help. Forgive us, Lord. Be our Lord and Savior. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask this very sincerely. And everyone said together, amen. Hi, Rod Hember here. We go through the Bible every year from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Now you can join us and watch at the time you like by searching Bible Discovery TV on the Roku box or on Amazon Fire TV. 
anytime you want to watch us, we're there. Get a hold of it. Watch us anytime you want to. Well, it's time now to carry on with our Bible study. And today I'm actually going to be going on an adventure outside to discover creation and the creator of that creation. And specifically, I want to focus on a title of God used frequently by Isaiah, but also used by Jeremiah and even the psalmist. And that title is the Holy One of Israel. Now, of course, God goes by a lot of different names in the Bible, and each, each of them reveals something about his nature. And that's what I really want to dig into today with the Holy One of Israel. So let's go. Hi friends, it's Ryan Hembry here. And today I want to highlight a specific title of God used mostly by Isaiah the prophet. And that title is the Holy One of Israel. Of course, God is called by a lot of names in the Bible and all of them reveal something about his nature. But what can we learn from this specific name of God? Well, it's a really good question. So grab your Bibles and let's go. Okay, so one of the most notable features of Isaiah is his frequent use of the phrase, the Holy One of Israel. As a matter of fact, this title of God is used 31 times in the Old Testament, and 26 of those occurrences are in the book of Isaiah alone. The other five occur in Psalms and Jeremiah. Isaiah also uses other variations of this title for God, such as the Holy One of Jacob, and simply the Holy One. Clearly, says George Knight, the holiness of God is one of the major themes of the prophet Isaiah. At the beginning of his ministry, Isaiah had a vision of God in the temple. He was sitting on his throne and winged seraphim, or angelic messengers, were singing his praises. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, while this threefold expression, holy, 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 could be understood as a reference to God's triune nature, in Hebrew thought, triple repetition expresses the highest degree of something, in this case, God's holiness. That's why this vision of the Holy One made Isaiah very aware of his sin and unworthiness. But God seared his lips with a hot coal carried by one of the seraphim. This, of course, symbolized God's purging of the prophet's sin. And like Isaiah, we too should be deeply troubled by our sinful state, realizing that we also are unworthy to stand before a completely holy God. This humble attitude is that good and godly fear and sorrow that the Bible talks about, which brings us to repentance, which leads us to salvation and to forgiveness. Because just as Isaiah's sins were purified through the burning coal, so too are our sins purified by Jesus Christ, the refiner's fire, when we turn to him. So just to elaborate a little bit, our attitude towards God needs to be like Isaiah's. He was really disturbed over his sin, and he was a man of God. So we might think that we're good people, but that's only because we're evaluating ourselves by our own standard. But when we begin to evaluate ourselves by God's standard, well, we soon realize just how sinful we are. I mean, all you have to do is read through the Ten Commandments. And let's just test ourselves here with five of them right now. How many lies have you told in your life? Have you ever stolen something? Have you ever taken the name of God in vain? How are we doing so far? Let's talk about the last two. Do not commit adultery and do not murder. Now, I know not everyone has physically committed those last two sins, but did you realize that Jesus extended these two commandments to include the thoughts of our hearts? That even if we look at another person with lust, then we've committed adultery with them in our heart. Or if we look with hatred on someone, then we've murdered them in our heart. Do you still think that you're a good person? Well, if we're honest with ourselves, we'll come to the same conclusion as the Apostle Paul did in Romans 3.23 and 6.23, when he said that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and that the punishment for that sin is death, and that should cause us to be fearful and sorrowful. But Paul says it's this godly sorrow that produces repentance leading to salvation in Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. The only one who lived that perfect life that we never could and then paid for our sin with his own blood. He can and he will purify you from your sin if you turn from that sin and trust on Jesus Christ. This, my friends, this is a true conversion.
Yeah, and that's really important, Ryan. We need to pay attention to that. So come to Christ today. Corey? All right. Well, I wanted to talk about someone that we read about in Jeremiah chapter 40. Now, Judah had been left in a pretty precarious situation, right? Jerusalem had been destroyed. The king had been carted off into exile into Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar appointed Gedaliah as a governor of the Babylonian province of Judah now at this point. But there was an assassination plot afoot. And in Jeremiah chapter 40, we see that behind the assassination of Gedaliah, the governor of Judah, was Baalis, the king of the Ammonites. Take a look. Once he had effectively subdued Judah and destroyed the city of Jerusalem in 586 BC, Nebuchadnezzar, the formidable king of Babylon, then set up a man named Gedaliah as governor of Judah, a role designed to replace the kingship of Jerusalem. This governor, however, would not last long. Jeremiah chapters 40 and 41 reveal an assassination plot backed by Baalis, king of the Ammonites. A plot that was successful in its goal of killing the governor and his officials, but unsuccessful in terms of taking booty. King Baalis and his instrument of assassination, a man named Ishmael, survived. But they lost all of their captives in a battle with the Judeans. The survivors of this disaster were then left to deal with their fear of any sort of punitive response from Babylon. The Ammonites appear often in the Old Testament of the Bible, which is where much of our current information about them comes from. Their territory was located in what is today modern Jordan. Two archaeological discoveries in this region have added to our knowledge not only of the Ammonites in general, but in this biblical King Baalis. The first artifact was a bulla, a clay impression of a signet seal once used to sign and secure a written document. Once read, this seal impression was found to have belonged to an Ammonite royal official about the same time as the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon. The seal read, belonging to Milcom, servant of Baalis. The second discovery was of a signet seal itself. Measuring a scant half inch in diameter and made of brown stone, its partially preserved surface still contained the name of its owner, Baalis, King of the Ammonites. Once fully reconstructed using contemporary documents for comparison, archaeologists settled on a final reading of belonging to Baalis, King of the Sons of Ammon. Interesting things as we continue to look at this time period of Jeremiah, lots of people verified historically. Yeah, it really is fascinating stuff, Corey. Thank you, Janice. Well, I had some interesting points. There are some chapters in the Bible when we're going through it that's a little bit difficult to bring and wrap our minds around segments. So today, as I was reading about the insurrection against Gedaliah and reading through, I picked out some things that maybe you didn't recognize on the surface. So we have 80 men, it says here, um, that came from Shechem. This is verse 5 of Jeremiah 41. Uh, they came from Shechem, from Shiloh, and from Samaria. 80 men, it says, with their uh, beards shaved and their clothes torn, and those are signs of mourning that we know about, having cut themselves. They were bringing offerings and incense in their hand to bring them to the house of the Lord. So these 80 men who came from Shechem, Shiloh, and Samaria came with offerings and incense to the temple of the Lord. Even though the temple was destroyed, the land that it had been standing on was still considered holy. So, and if you'll notice here, their offerings were bloodless sacrifices, right? They were bringing um, incense into their land in their hands. The men came with their beards shaved, their garments torn, and had cut themselves or gashed themselves. These are all signs of mourning, but you can see that even though they were coming as genuine worshipers of the Lord, they had adopted cultic practices from Baal worship that was forbidden in the law of God. And that is gashing themselves or cutting themselves. So we see that these people had actually, there was syncretism 
uh, with the laws of God and pagan cultures. So I thought that was very interesting to just read in that one verse of those men coming. Now think about this. Ishmael spared 10 of those men. He killed the others. He killed 70 of them. And he only saved 10 because these men said that they found hidden treasure in the field that they would show Ishmael. So he spared them. It says, where is that here? Uh, let's see. Do not kill us. That's verse 8. For we have treasures of wheat, barley, oil, and honey in the field. So he desisted and did not kill them among their brethren. To me, Ishmael's greed and deceit showed his true character. He had no good reason to kill the 70 men. So these points um, I found, I thought, they were very interesting from this passage of scripture. Honestly, when we slow down and we can really meditate and study on the word of God, there is so much in there. So I hope maybe I've just kind of whet your appetite to go back and read through it again and do a little bit of a study on it. Spotify is a great place where you can get your favorite podcast. I don't know if you knew this, but Bible Discovery is on Spotify. We've been there for a couple of years. You can, you can get a, a subscription to our podcast and we'll send it to you every day through Spotify. So you don't have to miss a program. Take Spotify and check it out. Lord, today we pray, help us to seek you. Help us to follow your word. Because as we read your word, we need to hear it. In Jesus' name.